Freelance, double XP, and the new Adept Hand Cannon rolling all on the same weekend, I knew I was gonna be grinding some trials. And with the community voting on the worst map option, like they always do, I decided on a self-imposed challenge that would span the entire weekend to not only keep the games a little more exciting, but also rapidly accelerate my own hair loss. Let's talk rules. Most importantly, I must go flawless once on every subclass in the game. That is Arc, Solar, Void, Stasis, once each for Hunter, Titan, and Warlock for a total of 12 flawless cards in one weekend. I am not allowed to switch my subclass made card or mid-game, I can only change when the card is either completed or reset. Also, despite my therapist's recommendation, I am adding the second rule of no duplicate exotic armor. I must use a different exotic armor piece for every card, and again, no switching exotics mid-card or mid-game. Ideally, this rule will force me to adapt to an entirely different playstyle with every subclass change, and I won't be able to use something like Antaeus Wards to just W-key my way through all the Titan cards, because they really don't care what subclass you're on. I deflected it! <laughs> And that's it for the intro. This video is not sponsored. Nobody's paying me to do this. I really am just that disrespectful to my own mental health. Card number one. I decide I want to start off the challenge as strong as I can. So for card one, I go with my usual trials loadout, which is Stasis Hunter and Foe Tracer. This combination works super well together. The idea is to use Foe Tracer's airborne effectiveness boost to go for lots of unexpected jump shots with a hand cannon, while Revan and Shatter Dive will let you escape the air quickly if you get caught out. Also, <clears throat> Those stats are hot. Discipline's really the only one that matters with this build though. Let's hop into the games. Unfortunately, the footage quality for this card in particular is pretty bad. I was trying to stream the challenge, but in case you couldn't tell, I am god awful at streaming. The feed is choppy and grainy, my cam is way too big. The audio is also all over the place, so for this one I'll probably just talk over it. I'll try and find some of the better parts to show you, but for the most part it's actually pretty unwatchable. It's all back to normal in the next card, so I'll probably just skip past most of this one. You're not gonna miss very much, Hunter Duskfield spam is super free in the current sandbox. With 100 discipline, grenade kickstart, and all the stasis fragments that help you with grenade regeneration, by the time your dust field actually disappears, your next one is like 60% cooled down. We did lose our mercy on game 5 due to a quitter, but other than that we had no issues on the card and were able to get a pretty easy first try flawless. I am sure the other stasis subclasses will go just as smoothly later in the video. For now though, the card was good, the class was great, and the loot was neither. Next. Man, I have not been playing this class enough. I actually mained Bottom Tree Arc Staff in PvP up until Arc 3.0 came out, and even though it's a lot weaker now, it definitely feels good to be back on it. I'm going with a remake of my old favorite Arc Strider build, which is actually with the Frosties. Combined with what is now Spark of Focus and Spark of Recharge, you get super high ability uptime completely passively. The damage resist dodge used to be a staple of Arc Strider, but since it requires Amplified now, I'd choose to ditch it entirely in favor of the Tempest Strike melee. This definitely ended up being the right call. I was actually super impressed with the work this melee was doing. This map has lots of long, narrow hallways, and it's pretty hard to escape the wave if you put it in the right spot. Unfortunately, arc bolt grenades do hit like wet paper after the 3.0 update, which was a lot harder to get used to than I expected. There were a lot of engagements where I was caught off guard because I expected the grenade to kill and it actually just left them 1 HP. We did lose our mercy on game 5 again, and I bet you can't guess how. You have three guesses. No, what? And then he just shoots me through- I want you to know that it's taking everything in my willpower to not launch into a 10 minute rant about this. Like, I'm editing this video a week after this card, and I can still feel myself getting mad just hearing the sound effect. Like, I'm not even that bothered about how the round turned out. There's a lot of things I could have done better. I could have, in this position here, I could have res my teammate, I could have waited to get my health back. But in the moment, I couldn't actually remember if my super bar was visible or not above the banner. And instead of making an informed decision, I decided to just go for a swing. I do have to give props to this guy, though, because they were completely ready for it. I counted 
15 frames between my deflect dropping and them shooting, so props to them. Other than that though, the games were pretty uneventful, which I guess is a good thing if you still have 10 subclasses to go. It's also pretty rejuvenating to see that the loot is only getting worse. With half the Hunter subclasses down, I decided to go with Night Stalker next. I actually never play this subclass in PvP, I just don't really enjoy invisibility as a mechanic, but it's definitely super strong, especially in Freelance. My general idea is to pair it with Cloud Strike and go for invis flanks to set up some surprise multi-kills. This strategy ended up working amazingly. With the way this map plays, most teams will just sit on either side of the middle lane waiting for something to happen, and comboing a smoke into a dodge gives me like 20 seconds straight of unbroken invisibility, which is more than enough to take these long flank routes. I do have to move a bit slowly while flanking to avoid jump scares because of the recent radar changes for invis, but so long as I'm prepared for it, I don't really have any issues. Oh, I'm using Wormhusk for this, by the way, which I also never use. I went through all my footage, and this moment here was the only time I ever actually got the health regen. I kind of just forgot I had it on, to be honest. Since I was using Invis way more offensively than defensively, I definitely would have gotten more use out of something like Graviton or Kefries, but I ended up going 7-0 with relatively no issues anyway. There was one scary moment when this guy very mysteriously starts lagging everywhere after we go up on rounds, but on 4-4, I was able to get a quick snipe on them to secure our first No Mercy used card. Overall, this is 100% a build that I would use again, and I definitely want to get more practice with Invis. What I don't want to revisit, however, is whatever that is. Got your ass. <laughs> You're insane. <laughs> He got shit on. Number three. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> That's my boy, holy sh- To literally nobody's surprise, we are using the Ahamkara Spine for the Gunslinger card. I mean, who could have seen Trip Mines being good on this map, right? It's not like it's a big open map with limited cover and lots of giant flat walls that face directly towards all the spots people like to sit at. Also, at this point, some friends wanted to watch my progress, so I'm just screen sharing to them in Discord, and I think their comments on the trip mines sum it up way better than I can. All right, subtract 100 damage from this round, and all of that is just your bullshit, so let's see it. Holy shit. <laughs> <laughs> subtract 100 from that, dog. Hey. At least my, my trip mind went cooldown, right? Like, I can't throw it again right away, right? <laughs> yeah, you can't <laughs> right, use it. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, no. It's worth noting that trip mines are pretty map dependent. It would be a lot harder to get this build going on something like Fortress, for example. But on this map, the old shoot once and grenade combo is just so unstoppable. That being said, we did suffer our first reset of the challenge after getting back to back AFK teammates on Flawless Game. At this point, though, we're really warmed up with the already strong build, so the next attempt is just a straight 7 0 Flawless. Oh, also, I am still using Cloud Strike here because of how good it felt during the Night Stalker card. And for whatever reason, people just have no issue resing their teammates in front of it. Please go for the res. <laughs> and with that card done, we are finished with Hunter. Friday night is almost over at this point, so I grab my loot, bid the boys farewell, and get some sleep for Saturday's grinding. Man, dude, I just... Not <laughs> escape. Not swap, so at this point in the video, if you're thinking something like, well, this is boring, why did the intro say this was a mistake? I came here to see him suffer, damn it. Why is it going well? Uh, yeah, I've already made a terrible mistake. Hunter is by far my strongest character. Why did I use it first? Flawless pool is in 24 hours. I am not comfortable on Warlock. I never play Sunbreaker. I don't even know how Behemoth works. What the hell am I doing? So even though I wake up early on Saturday, I end up procrastinating most of the day on starting the Titan cards. To give some context, my next couple cards are going to be do or die for me in terms of continuing the challenge. My general goal is to finish Titan by the end of Saturday so I can dedicate two full days to dragging my Warlock through the Flawless Pool. Even though I would say I'm weaker on Warlock overall, if I can't finish Behemoth and Sunbreaker before Flawless Pool goes up, I don't think I have any chance of finishing the challenge. Not only that, but I've barely played Titan this season, so it's a struggle just getting four different armor sets up to a decent light level. I end up deciding on my exotics ahead of time, because I realize if I only use exotic boots, it'll allow me to reuse a lot of my legendary armor without having to infuse into more sets. So with a general strategy in mind, as time winds down on Saturday, I decide I've stalled enough and I hop right back into Trials. Oh. 
in true Titan fashion, I say to hell with starting strong. Sunbreaker first, baby. Yeah, this card was pretty rough, actually. With my other exotic boot options synergizing much better with the other subclasses, I decided to burn the Peacekeepers on Solar. Peacekeepers Ikelos is obviously an insanely strong combo, but on this map, I had a pretty tough time just getting close enough to use it. I did my best to play around the close quarters areas by B-Flag, but if the enemy team just doesn't push me there, it's pretty hard to get value out of the kit. And with Sunbreaker's significantly weaker neutral game, it's difficult for me to be aggressive and close those gaps. That being said, with enough patience, I was definitely able to make it work, mostly due to 100 Resilience Barricade spam, helping me cut those gaps in half, as well as 100 strength to make sure I always had a movement tool to escape those bad situations. I may not be that comfortable with Sunbreaker, but playing around barricades and using shoulder charge for movement is very familiar to me from Void and Arc, so I do my best to leverage that as much as possible. I do get a lot of good value from the Sniper against more passive players, and I also record what may be the first hammer of soul kill in Trials since Shadowkeep, but to be honest, I really have to give a shout out to my teammates. I wrote in my notes while I was playing that I got more competent teammates during this card than all of the other other cards over the weekend combined. And despite losing my mercy on game 6 to the teammate who had basically carried me the game before, we end up with a first try Sunbreaker Flawless, which is a huge relief. This is the subclass I was dreading the most by far, so I'm super glad we got it done quickly. We do have to get through Behemoth at some point today, but it's still fairly early on Saturday, so I decided to go with something a bit more familiar next. With Sentinel up on the docket, I am expecting a pretty easy time here. Because Dune Marchers work best on Arc and Paragon Griefs don't work on Stasis, I Actually, is that, is that true? Do I know that? Does Peregrine work with Shiver Strike? I don't think it does. I decided to just use Peregrine Greaves here. I generally don't use them much aside from mid-round switches to counter supers, which obviously isn't allowed in this challenge. So having them on all the time is actually a fairly significant adjustment to what I'm used to. It takes me a little while to realize that Peregrine Strike has a longer activation time than Shield Bash, meaning to get the one shot, you actually need to sprint a little bit longer than normal. This earns me a couple confusing deaths early on, but eventually I make the adjustment. I am a little sick of sniping at this point, so I decide to switch to Pulse Rifle Shotgun and just be an animal in the close range. Don't have much else to say here. Everyone knows Void Titan's really strong, so I'll just let the clips roll. Unfortunately, I did end up losing a lot of my footage for this card. Uh, something to do with my record the last 60 seconds button being really close to the turn off all recording software button. Uh, could be anybody's fault though, don't really know. I'm not about to go re-record it, so we're just gonna move on. I did also lose my footage of opening the lighthouse chest, but hey, that is not too bad. Let's just get this over with, shall we? From my understanding, there's basically two ways you can play Behemoth. And since I'd rather end the challenge now than be the guy sitting in a corner shooting crystals all game, I instead try to build around the Cryoclasm slide and making it as obnoxious as possible. I go with Antaeus Wards to make myself effectively immune during the slide with max discipline glacier grenades to honestly just try and jump scare people. I do have Whisper of Rhyme and Tectonic Harvest on, which I know people hate. Please don't cancel me, I just don't really know what else to use. I only have one method of making crystals with this build, and it's already being used offensively. So the only time I really get much value out of it at all is by sliding backwards into the shards after a bad push, which does actually save my life a couple times. Alright, build sounds good, right? Let's look at game one. <laughs> Yeah, it all sounds good on paper, but I really still don't know what I'm doing. I'm pretty comfortable with Antaeus Wards, but the slide boost from Crowdclasm is so jarring if you're not used to it. I actually find myself being afraid to slide in some situations because I'm afraid I'm just going to over push, and I end up just kind of dying from indecision a lot. There's a lot of learning moments for me over the next few games. For example, I learned to just stop trying to make this melee work, but I am definitely improving. I'm getting the timing down for the slide, and the power of this combo is starting to show. Also, if you hate fusion rifles, this clip's for you. The games aren't free by any means, but with some effort, we're able to make progress on the card. On game three, though, we get a teammate who rage quits when it's 1-1 in rounds. That's really annoying considering the game was super winnable. And the reason I know it's winnable, because we heckin' won, baby! Honestly, I gotta give it all to my teammate, though. The dude was landing one or two snipes at the beginning of every round. As soon as I started playing around that, instead of, you know, trying to slide tackle everybody with Behemoth, we had zero issues. We get them on my team again the next game, and it's just an easy steamroll with three people. So just like that, we're at four wins with Mercy still intact. In game five, though, my new friend is paired against me, and I'm getting a bit nervous about the state of that Mercy. 
Fortunately though, I get the luck of the draw on teammates this game, and we're able to make some key plays to get us that fifth win. Also, just to clarify, by key plays, I mean he quit. Well, that was stressful. Surely game six won't be nearly as, uh, oh no. Well, that's not good. Look, just cover your eyes or right, it'll be over soon. Let's go! Look, it wasn't pretty, but it worked, alright? I took some notes, and if it comes up again in Game 7, I'll be ready. Never mind. Yeah, I gotta look up some videos or something, because I have no idea how this super is even supposed to work. My Glacial Quake Redemption arc is gonna have to wait, however, because that is behemoth done, baby. Who needs a mercy anyway, am I right? You hear that, Saint? I did it. Now give me that god roll. Okay. It's getting pretty late on Saturday, but with Flawless Pool starting in the morning, I decide to knock out Arctitan while I'm here. Get it? Knockout? Like the ability? Ha ha ha! How is this allowed in the video game? It is taking a significant amount of effort to not launch into a 20 minute rant about how grenades and barricades got nerfed, but not this. Instead, because it is late and I have no energy left for complaining, I will strap on the dude marchers and quietly revel in the fact that anyone who steps within 10 meters of me literally just loses on the spot. The recent storm grenade nerf plays no part here either, as the dual jolting lightning grenades that Arc Titan gets completely dominate this map. This card goes by so fast that I barely get any interesting footage to show, except for this goofy play in the last round of the card where I whiff my Thunder Crash, but it causes their Warlock to panic and whiff their Nova Bomb. Teammates are able to clean them up through the chaos, and just like that, we are done with the Titan cards, baby. We actually did it in fewer losses than the Hunter cards, which is pretty interesting considering that our KD dropped by a full 0.6. Just goes to show how much work my teammates were doing on the Sunbreaker and Behemoth cards. Anyways, with two characters completed, we grab our legendary shards from the Lighthouse chest and we get to bed early. With a good night's sleep, I'm hoping that I'll be fresh and ready for some flawless pool games tomorrow. I definitely am not gonna procrastinate again. Nope, not me. I'm gonna go right back and I'm on a mountain. All right, guess we're doing this again. Uh. Man, this really isn't a good look for me. I'm sorry you had to see that. Let's just go play some Destiny. During the Sunbreaker card yesterday, I matched against this Blue Bolt guy. I don't know them personally, but I matched them in quick play enough to know they're a god on Stormcaller. So when it comes time to play Stormcaller myself, I basically just tried to copy their loadout as best as I could. And that is why I'm using Crown of Tempests, which probably would not have been my first choice, but we're here now. Well, if you couldn't tell, yeah, this one was a roller coaster. There's a huge leap in difficulty going into the Flawless Pool, not just in terms of player skill, but the amount of bug abuse as well. It seems like at least one person every game is using this glitch spot. People are shooting their tethers and dying intentionally so we can't destroy it. This bug is abusing me, but somehow, after more resets than all the other cards combined, we finally make it through and I pop off so hard my mic just gives up translating it. Let's go. In the midst of all that struggle, there were a few key loadout pieces that really made a difference. The most notable one is obviously the Lightning Surge aspect. In my clan, I'm known as the guy who complains constantly about this melee despite never actually using it myself. And it's good to know that I was totally justified because this thing is broken! Seriously though, if you're good with flick sliding, this melee feels like Mask of Backers if it had no additional cooldown and did somewhere between 160 and 40,000 damage every time you use it. The other big factor was this Syncopation Pulse Rifle. I love this thing so much and it put in some work this card. I did switch to No Time to explain towards the end, mostly because it just feels right when you're using Arc Souls. I don't use No Time very much, but since I'm expecting its usage to only increase as Flawless Pool goes on, now's as good a time as any to get some practice. Well, I definitely regret procrastinating all day. That took way longer than I expected and it's already pretty late on Sunday. I have work in the morning and I don't think I can afford to leave three subclasses to Monday, so I decide to burn my strongest Warlock build next. Voidwalker has been a staple in my arsenal ever since Void 3.0 came out, and it's the only Warlock subclass I use in Trials with some regularity. I run Void Soul and Chaos Accelerant alongside Ophidian Aspects and Terabah, which all come together in a really interesting way. With high recovery and discipline, you can apply enormous pressure with Void Soul and Supercharge Axiom Bolts at the same time, which is really hard to escape in confined spaces. Axions hit for 110 on weakened targets, I think, and if they try and fight back, you generally just win on the spot. On the other hand, if they disengage, you get a ton of free Terabah Charge and just win later and instead. 
Using the already down healing rift lets you re-engage in the fight super fast, and oftentimes you build Ravenous Beast so much faster than anyone in the lobby expects you to. Ophidian Aspects is the bow on top as well, giving Terraba faster reload, handling, and airborne effectiveness, while also just helping to pull out your guns faster after Voidwalker's long ability animations. And since we have a sniper, the Ophidian's extended melee range will help us in the close quarters. I'm not even gonna mention the Pocket Singularity melee, which might actually be my favorite ability in the game. Overall, the card went about as well as we could hope for. Voidwalker is one of the best classes in the game for area denial, and considering 95% of the gunfights in this map happen in this one hallway, it's not that hard to get value out of it. We had one reset early in the card due to levers, but fortunately the games afterwards were pretty smooth, and despite a teammate be seeing in game 7, we land some crispy snipes to end the card. Yeah, he disconnected, that's why it took so long to show up, for sure. Yeah, I'm just gonna go in on that. Very close to my super here. Just play on them. Only one enemy is left. One minute space, left. Space, 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 space. Yeah, there we go. And GG. That's void done. The Voidwalker card going smoothly is definitely a huge relief, as we now have one full day dedicated to finishing up Shadebinder and Dawnblade to complete the challenge. Solar is probably the stronger of the two, but in terms of comfortability, they're about the same to me. The Void card leaves me in a good mood though, and I'm confident that Monday's games will go just as smooth. Well, that's not ideal. <laughs>
Of all the bungee gods that could have answered my prayers, the god of UI bugs was not the one I was expecting, but hey, I will take it. This seemingly small bug leads to literally one second of confusion later in the round and ends up being the only reason I was able to pull it out. And with their supers out of the way, they have nothing to stop my Winter's Wrath the following round, nor my teammates Blade Barrage the round after. I almost cry when the victory screen comes up until I remember that it's only game three. Jokes aside though, even though Freelance Teraba mirror match is a little wonky, it was still an awesome chance to get to play Jake. I've been watching him since his 1v3 trials videos in Destiny 1, and watching him play over the years was a big part of my growth as a player. GG's to him. Fortunately though, none of the other games are even remotely as difficult as that was. Teraba Sniper is feeling really good so I stick with it. I also realized that you don't need Cloud Strike at all to get these team kills, and a Legendary Sniper is doing just fine. Teraba also works decently well with this build, as I can use Frozen targets for free charge if I'm out of sniper ammo. We use this newfound synergy all the way to game 7, where I'm lucky enough to get the Peacekeeper's Ikelos Maniac on my team to finally complete the Shadebinder Flawless, and oh my god, it's been 6 hours. Oh my god, get me off of this suck I don't want to do it anymore. Well, it's a good thing I actually started early today. It's only about 5.30 in the afternoon, but man, I am exhausted after that Shadebinder card. I still have some time, so I decided to take a couple hours rest, but if Dawnblade is as tough as that was, there is a good chance I just don't finish this challenge. I have work in the morning, and I do not have another 6 hour play session in me tonight. Or, you know, so I thought. Man, after the last three cards, it feels amazing to have some movement again. With both Icarus Dash and Transversive Steps, I feel like I'm flying compared to the Shadebinder cards. I'm pretty indecisive with my weapon loadout for a while, but eventually I land on this old plug one with Kickstart. I haven't used it in forever, but I remember loving it with slide boosting boots, and that definitely holds up because I get immediate value out of the switch. I'm also back on the no time to explain. At this point in the night, it feels like every single person in this pool is using it. And even though I've never really liked the gun, at this point it just feels mandatory. It's pretty hard for me to 1v1 players who are actually good with it, but I'm able to leverage the Radiant from Celestial Fire and the healing from Grenades and Rifts in these long Pulse Rifle standoffs to get some value out of that as well. That being said, card progress is near impossible. The number of players in early card Flawless Pool is so low at this point that I'm actually just playing the same 10 people on repeat. I matched this one guy so many times that after the third game we ended up just adding each other. We chatted for a few hours in between games, and the conversation really helped to keep me sane because the game was doing me zero favors. I had multiple matches that started with 5 people, more and more people are just using this glitch bot, and I even made it to game 7 once just for a lever to immediately send me back to early card hell. The only thing keeping me going is the fact that I'm actually playing pretty well. The fatigue is definitely catching up to me, but I'm doing everything I can to power on. I keep telling myself, if I can just get the 4 wins with my mercy intact, I'll be home free. But getting lucky with the matchmaking for 4 games in a row seems impossible. I'll play out of my skull for one game, and the next game starts with 5 people. I'll somehow pull off that 2v3 just for the next game to be even more unwinnable. Just 4 wins with mercy. 4 wins. 4 wins. It's almost midnight. I'm at zero wins. I'm drained. I gave it everything I had. I have a work meeting at 7.30 and I haven't made it past three wins in hours. Even my new friend threw in the towel. My clanmates have been cheering me on all weekend, but I know a full card on this map could easily take another 90 minutes and I'm pretty sure they're all asleep, but as Monday night ends and Tuesday morning begins, I open up Discord to let them know that I am giving up. Damn, Jake. You know Terry loves love. I'm in.
Oh my god, oh, fucking finally. <laughs> That's right, baby. Take that challenge no one asked me to do. Hey, listen, if you made it this far, I appreciate the hell out of you. This video took me four days to film, two weeks to edit, and several years off my life expectancy. My only request is that if you liked it, do not subscribe for more. I will not be doing this again when Strand comes out. Nope, never. Never, ever, 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 ever. ever.